The following conversation was facilitated by a Mandarin English interpreter, so listeners may find this episode requires more concentration than usual. Our guest Martian was born in China and is from a different generation than the students leading the protests in Hong Kong, but as someone who has faced punishment for his criticism of the Chinese Communist Party, his perspective is valuable. As the interpreter, who is from Hong Kong, told us that even he finds it hard to keep up with what is happening at the protests, we urge people to get the latest news from sources in Hong Kong where possible. Welcome to the Glasshouse Game Show, recorded in London at Glasshouse Brick Lane. Today, I'm joined by Sam, hello, Alex P, hello, and a special guest, Marjan. Hello, hello. He'll be talking to us through an interpreter.、Uh, we're going to talk about、uh, Blitzchung, the situation in Hong Kong, and、uh, the relation with China.、Uh, that's why we've got Marjan here today.、Um, would you like to introduce yourself so that people know who you are? So、uh, Marjan is a writer himself. He's lived in London for many years. He's got four kids. Recently, what he's been doing is、uh, writing up this book in front of him,、uh, China Dream. It was written、uh, last year, and、uh, mm-hmm. his most up-to-date work is going to be about London, but China's London. So、mm. that's very interesting. That is very interesting. How is it? So I have seven brothers and sisters. What is it like having four children? Is it very busy? Yeah, he feels like he's、uh, the tour guide of、uh, a, a tour group. <laughs> so every day he's、uh, bringing, you know, bringing his kids around, doing different all sorts of stuff.、Yeah. Mm. What's the?、Uh, so you're, you're, you want to write about、uh, Chinese London? Are you going to talk about kind of the best places to eat and things like that as well? What's the best place to eat Chinese food in London?、Uh, yeah. So, so what he's saying is that、um, China, China's London. What he meant by China's London is that、um, he, as a fellow Chinese who's lived in London for many years, but did not. Managed to learn English.、Mm. He is trying to understand London, portray London from a Chinese perspective,、um, from his eyes. That he's a he's a Chinese who doesn't speak English, but living in London. So he's trying to、uh, bring his worldview to his audience and to his readers. He,、uh, what what he feels most. Deeply about London is that、um, London has an immense history, a very profound history, and Karl Marx has lived here for over thirty years,、mm-hmm. and it was him who brought him to London after he's、uh, he he had to seek refuge elsewhere because he can no longer、uh, live in China anymore.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because Karl Marx used to visit lots of places in this area. I think there's someone who does a tour of this area.、Uh, we were saying lots yesterday. Of tours in this oh, okay. Area, well, yeah, we saw someone yesterday them, right outside、yeah. the window,、um, and CG was like, "Oh, I know that person. <laughs> They do tours about Karl Marx."、Um, uh, Martian, what do you what do you think of our bar before we start talking? It's very new. Do you like it? He yeah, thinks was,、uh, this well, bar is really beautiful. <laughs> he loves the architecture, <laughs> but what he feels <laughs> most about is not the exterior <laughs> interior, <laughs> more like、uh, the sense of、uh, renovation that, that that lies inside.、Um, he he thinks that this bar is in reinvigorating this new area, which is somehow、uh, embodied in Karl Marx's、uh, philosophy as、mm. well. He also mentioned that、uh, not far from this place, if we walk down that road, there's actually a bar where Lenin and Stalin has met. Wow! So you could imagine what, what all sorts of conversation they were having back then. Right, and if you guys are able to sort of overthrow what they've been doing in that, <laughs> in that bar,、okay. you will become the Chinese Communist Party. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess that's what he meant. <laughs> okay, so、uh, in this episode,、uh, we're we're not sure when this episode will air, so we don't know what the exact state of、uh, the protests in Hong Kong will be at the time. But we wanted to talk about it because、um, it's it's touched the games industry in a way. So it's 
a lot of video game players have become aware of what's going on in Hong Kong through uh, this event with Blitzchung and Blizzard. So what we wanted to achieve in this conversation is to help people who play video games understand better what is happening in Hong Kong, um, to examine the actions that Blizzard took against Blitzchung and to contextualize them in the company's history, uh, which is why Sam is here to talk about Blizzard and um, the kinds of things that the company has done in the past. And then we want to finish by asking whether people who play video games, who understand what's happening in Hong Kong, can do anything and whether they should do anything. Uh, so that's the, the kind of goal. <laughs> so I'll go through the events that have happened so far around Blitzchung's suspension. Um, feel free to stop me at any time if you need to explain uh, what I'm talking about. But um, So it started with, so on October 6th, a professional Hearthstone player called Blitzchung, who is from Hong Kong, uh, won a match at the Hearthstone Grandmasters in Taipei. And in a post-match interview, he said, liberate Hong Kong. And then the next day, the publisher of the game, Blizzard, uh, which is part owned by a Chinese company called Tencent, announced that they had suspended the player for 12 months. They wouldn't give him his prize money and that they would no longer work with the two uh, casters, the people who were interviewing him. Uh, and they said that he had uh, violated a competition rule. So uh, after that, uh, people who play video games who may not have known what was happening really in Hong Kong before started to take an interest. They started a hashtag, Boycott Blizzard, uh, which trended on Twitter. Uh, the Chinese publishing partner of Blizzard, NetEase, made a statement condemning Blitzchung, the player, and the casters. Um, and uh, other people started to protest. So the American University team at the American Collegiate Hearthstone Championship held up a sign that said, Free Hong Kong, Boycott Blizz. Um, Mitsubishi Motors Taiwan ended its sponsorship of Blizzard's esports events. Um, and then on October 12th, uh, Blizzard's president, J. Allen Brack, made a statement who said, our relationships in China had no influence on our decision. And they shortened the suspension to six months and gave him the money back. And then, um, so uh, Blizzard also gave the American University who did their protest a six month ban as well. And then on October 18th, US senators wrote a bipartisan letter to Activision Blizzard CEO, Bobby Kotick, to express concern and urge the company to decide whether to look beyond the bottom line and promote American values like freedom of speech and thought or to give in to Beijing's demands in order to preserve market access. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that I wanted Alex on the show was to talk about the kind of the US perspective um, as well. Uh, and then uh, at BlizzCon, which is a com uh, convention that Blizzard holds every year, uh, Brack apologized for acting too quickly, um, but they have confirmed that they won't repeal the punishments. So the six month ban will still hold and they are not working with the interviewers uh, who at the time of the protest ducked under their desks. Um, and then uh, recently things like um, Blizzard's vice president, Jeff Kaplan, uh, who Sam knows a lot about, told the Washington Post that he is a huge supporter of free speech and he wants the suspension reduced or eliminated. So people who work at Blizzard aren't happy with the decision either, but the decision has been made to, to keep this ban. So we wanted to start by talking about the, the protests themselves in Hong Kong. And uh, what some people might not know is that they do have five specific demands that they want so they want the they wanted originally the complete withdrawal of the proposed extradition bill which was formally withdrawn on october 23rd uh, they want the government to stop using the word riot in relation to the protests uh, they want the unconditional release of arrested protesters and charges against them to be dropped uh, they want an independent inquiry into police behavior and they want the implementation of genuine universal suffrage um, so i wanted to ask Marjan to explain why people in Hong Kong were so concerned about the possibility of being extradited to China and what might happen to them. Um, what he's talking about is that, um, um, of course, the people of Hong Kong are afraid of being extradited to China, but it's not just that. Um, the underlying reason of there being five demands in total is sort of a result from five years ago, the Umbrella Revolution. Um, back then, um, the people of Hong Kong were only asking for genuine universal suffrage. But what's happened in, this, in these five years uh, have sort of accumulated. They have lots of uh, anger, hatred, political momentum being denied, and therefore it had to explode somewhere. So 
um, of course they're afraid of being extradited being extradited uh, into China but that's not just that they mm-hmm. also uh, would like um, the other four being being answered and being fulfilled um, the main reason why um, Hong Kong is afraid of being extradited to China is that um, numerous cases of um, mysterious disappearances had happened in Hong Kong. We thought it could only happen back in mainland China, but in the past five years, these horrible stuff has actually happened in Hong Kong. He's quoting his uh, one example uh, being his very own friend, Gui Minghai. He's a poet um, uh, in his um, bookstore in Causeway Bay. He got, you know, s- mysteriously abducted back to China. So these are the, 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 the incidents that, 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 that um, caveat, you know, Hong Kongers telling him, telling every one of us that we can't trust China. Mm-hmm. We, our, our lives could be endangered uh, at risk if we were being extradited into China because there's no good legal system that protects our human rights. So uh, you talked about uh, the comparison between what's happening today and what has happened in Tibet. And I wanted to also talk about um, comparing or seeing if there are comparisons between the protests today in Hong Kong and uh, the protests in Tiananmen Square uh, 30 years ago um, because Ma Tian was there. So uh, with the current protests in Hong Kong, there have been thousands of arrests. So there have been hundreds of thousands of protesters in total, um, estimates of up to a million at the rally on June 9th. Uh, thousands of arrests, thousands of injuries, uh, even some deaths, including uh, some suicides, one person who died from a fall and one who died after being hit by a brick, uh, reportedly. Um, so, Madian, since you were there, um, can you tell us if you see any similarities between the protests today in Hong Kong and the protests in Tiananmen? Um, another similarity he realizes is that um, the course of development of the two events um, were pretty alike. Um, back then, um, the local Beijing University students were protesting in the square, mm-hmm. and that drew uh, lots of attention from all across the country, um, leading uh, university students from different towns and cities to come join them. So people from everywhere are joining together. But then um, uh, the Tiananmen incident, I mean, uh, back then the protests uh, lasted for months and and, uh, then the people sort of um, sort of it couldn't last that long. So therefore the number of people inside the square um, had reduced. And that was when the PLA, uh, you know, deployed their their tanks to to crack down on the people. And similarly, um, in Hong Kong, um, you know, the protests uh, started with, you know, mostly university students, and that drew the support of uh, other Hong Kongers as well. But then again, um, the number of people may reduce over time, and that was when. Um, the police um, you know, forcefully entered um, uh, the Polytechnic University campus mm-hmm. and sort of cracked down on people in a similar manner. Okay, so I want to talk about the way in which the protests have escalated. I think, Alex, you had a question about this. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, just for perspective, you met her earlier. My partner is, um, she's from Guangdong, um, uh, China, and she's a passionate supporter of of the protesters in Hong Kong. Um, and there's a growing worry, I think, well, both with her and I think generally within um, uh, Chinese nationals who are supporters of Hong Kong, of a um, a schism, basically, of the relationship uh, between those. Um, between the Hong Kong protesters and those who might be their supporters, 
Um, and as well, a growing maybe mentality within the Hong Kong protesters um, of, you know, you're either with us or against us. And if that's a mentality that needs to happen for this revolution, for this protest to succeed. Mm. Do you Try to rephrase question? it. Maybe uh, sure. So, I mean, I'll just leave that. But um, hmm, how to rephrase it? So, there's a. Uh, I think with the protesters um, and people who want to support the protesters. So, for example, um, even in the Hong Kong body of government, uh, they're using um, like slurs that were used by the Japanese during World War II against the Chinese uh, in, re in reference to all Chinese people, regardless of whether those Chinese nationals support um, or, <laughs> or, or don't, basically. But so even, mm -hmm. even those supporters, like my wife, uh, who are ardently supporting the, the Hong Kong plight, um, if she has, if she even, you know, makes a mention of having an issue with like the use of language, which is only as important as we make it, right? But it's such a, it's such a small thing. So do we have to use this kind of language in reference to, to all Chinese people? Something that's so powerful, so charged. Um, the words that, that the Japanese invaders used on, uh, in when torturing uh, Chinese people. Um, because it's a well it becomes like a personal thing versus an ideological thing mm. and is that um is that something that we feel that we need that the that the that we feel that we need to accept so um there's a i guess a an idea that all revolutions are flawed uh there's no perfect revolution and do we need to accept this revolution for all its flaws in order to support it? Is there any way to support this revolution without accepting it, flaws and all? That's a very difficult question. <laughs> no, <laughs> Wait a second. No, um, if, um, uh, I mean, I can get maybe even Zed to translate it because I think that she understands it. I don't know if you... If you um, would you mind if I ask more? Like, um, sure. So what you're trying to say is that um, the protesters of Hong Kong are using some slurs as well. Mm -hmm. And those are the flaws the protesters of Hong Kong are displaying. Yeah, Do so you find it a necessary evil? Um, in a way, yeah. So way. it's, um, which I'll, I'll call back to later in a later question, but there's a lot of parallels with uh, language used during the American civil rights movement mm -hmm. in the 60s of by any means necessary. Uh, you're either with us or against us. You're with us or you're the enemy. Um, and this, this is language being used uh, like, and I think personally, I think rightfully so by the Hong Kong mm -hmm. protesters. And is this something that, um, is this a flaw? Because a lot of people, moderates, just everyday Hong Kongers who are sick of getting late to work, <laughs> you know, mm. they, they want to support the protest, um, but they feel like it's, it's, it's beyond them to give up their daily routine. Mm. Um, they feel, I think, uh, that it's difficult to continue to support that protest, even though they, they believe in it because of the inconvenience and it's either, and the, the rhetoric, I guess, from a lot, some of mm. the protesters, that if you are not on the streets with us, and accepting this revolution flaws and everything that goes with that with that revolution, then you're actually not supporting it. You're not supporting the protest unless you're 100% in. And uh, I guess the question specifically from Ma Jen is if he feels that that is a necessity. Um, is, it, if, is it a necessity for the protest to succeed for anybody who supports it at, at all that they have to be 100% and be okay with all of the flaws, 100% of the revolution. Mm. Um, he first would like to talk about um, the youth of Hong Kong in comparison to their, uh, their parents. Um, the, the active protesters nowadays are usually the youth of Hong Kongers. Um, but um, their parents 
uh, by contrast, are actually people who flee China, who yeah yeah who 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 uh, flee the country, you know, years ago, trying to seek you know pursue for for freedom and and human right. Um, Hong Kong is a very internationalized society. Um, it has different dimensions. Locally, uh, because of its history, uh, it has a different lifestyle and culture than mainland China. But at the same time, uh, because of being ruled by the Brits for many, many years, uh, it also has an international, you know, oriented uh, dimension. So, um, it has been internationalized, but not exactly, uh, you know, completely internationalized. So, um, what he is trying to say is that um, Hong Kongers have a very uh, unique language um, that um, can't be transplanted to 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 or, or draw comparison with other societies in the world. Uh, Back in uh, the 1st of July, when the protesters of Hong Kong, um, you know, took over the legislature of Hong Kong, uh, he saw that uh, when the legislators and reference were trying to get in their way uh, for their own safety, they still declined the kind offer. They, they, they shoved them away and still... Um, took stormed over the legislative council building. If you take a skim or brief look into any um, online forums in the mainland China, you realize uh, the netizens, uh, the, the the Chinese netizens are using all sorts of slurs to 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 defame or describe Hong Kongers, and uh, similarly, um, Hong Kongers are using those slurs uh, against. Uh, mainland Chinese too, but uh, he sees this uh, as a very horrible um, phenomenon because um, what he 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 implies, what he could see from this uh, beneath this phenomenon is that um, the Chinese Communist Party is um, raising their next generation into dogs. Of the of the of the regime, and they could bite people anywhere in the world, be them in mainland China or in London or anywhere else in the world. So they would just go after anyone who 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 talks badly about China, mm -hmm. and they would just charge at them, attack them verbally or in different ways. Um, he thinks that uh, the CCP aren't treating uh, Hong Kongers as human beings. Hmm. They just see them as flesh. They try to de dehumanize Hong Kongers. Um, the same applies to their view on Taiwan as well. Um, the high-ranking officials of, um, of China keep saying that if they send the military to Taiwan, they will easily take over the place. And um, the 80, sorry, 800,000 people in Taiwan won't stand a chance. So that's the way they are describing the, the, uh, the people of Taiwan and Hong Kong. So in the face of um, the language um, used by the Chinese Communist Party, how they're in dehumanizing the people of China and Taiwan, he could see the only response being, you know, more and more hatred and, you know, um, you know, um, horrible language being used in response mm. to this. So he seems to think that this is inevitable. So there's, I, I mentioned that there was a lot of um, parallels, I guess, with the, with the rhetoric used by um, Hong Kong protesters and um, the American Civil Rights Movement in the 60s. Um, um, 
you're either with us or against us uh, by any means necessary. Um, and there's a very, um, the very famous quote during a speech from Martin Luther King, um, which I'll, I'll paraphrase in a, to apologize, I'm not nearly as eloquent as, <laughs> as, uh, as Martin Luther King, but um, basically uh, the moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is in the absence of tension to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action. And basically calling, um, Martin Luther King is basically calling the moderates, uh, the white moderates in America, the greatest stumbling block to the civil rights movement uh, because they're not, um, they're not 100 percent with the black civil rights movement. Um, they might agree with them in principle, but not willing to go the extra, well, any extra mile, basically mm -hmm. not willing to inconvenience themselves. Um, and is this is this something that is shared with the with the mentality of the Hong Kong protesters that this could also be a a stumbling block if they can't get the 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 moderates the the ones in Hong Kong who um, don't want to be inconvenienced but still agree with the cause uh, is that where the protest the revolution could fail if they can't yeah. manage to get if, them to their side if mm. the moderates to, to side yeah. them. correct right um, back when the Tiananmen Square incident happened. Uh, 200 to 300,000 of Hong Kongers uh, participated individual um, in the Victorian Park um, in Hong Kong. Um, they felt closely and deeply uh, with the people of China who was being who were being massacred um, back in Tiananmen Square. But then, um, throughout the course of these uh, 20 to 30 years, um, they realized there's actually nothing they could do about the situation in China. Um, no matter how they cared about, how much they cared about it, or how much they wanted to change the situation um, um, in China. So that sense of inadequacy sort of turned them inward mm. to look at only Hong Kong locally. Their, their way out was to you know, only care about Hong Kong and look for the uh, self-autonomy they were promised. So um, that has led to a disconnection between um, not only Hong Kong and China, but also the youth of Hong Kong and their uh, uh, previous generation. And the disconnection has led to um, this um, movement being leaderless because they thought they had to do what they have to do. And no one is going to tell me about what I have to do, what I ought to do. He once asked a youngster in Hong Kong, um, if you want Carrie Lam to step down, who would you put in place? Who would you put in charge? Or are you not even looking for a replacement? You're looking for a revolution an overthrow of the entire regime. Uh, he hadn't got a clear answer uh, from that youngsters he asked, to whom he asked those questions. Uh, what he could imply was that um, the youth of Hong Kong actually um, don't quite know what, don't quite understand what they're trying to achieve. They were just simply expressing and channeling their anger, leasing leash, to just, you know, have leash on it. And um, because he thinks that um, uh, democracy is achieved by the art of compromise, that's the essence of politics. Mm. And if you try to overthrow the current regime, that'd be a completely different story. Uh, he's drawn comparison to South Africa and other countries. Um, uh, compromise is very hard to achieve 
because um, what um, the people are facing is a very brutal and violent uh, military force. All these um, uh, totalitarian regimes has one thing in common is the rule by fear. Mm. Um, they have the terrifying ability to make you feel that every every step you take, you take it as an isolated individual, that no matter what you do, you could be easily followed and cracked down. And the system of secret police, is that called gustable? Mm. Yeah, uh, is uh, doing a very effective job in terrifying his people. Um, he's very saddened to see that all Hong Kongers had to remain faceless um, during their protest. It, it, it is because of nothing but fear. The, the, the government and police are exerting immense control over their people so that um, that's the only way that they had to, to they, they, they could they could possibly protest. He thinks that they, they are as sad as animals who wait to be slaughtered. Um, that's very, very heartbreaking to see. Uh, when they, another reason they might have to remain faceless or had their faces covered up is because maybe those people who are against their cause are not just uh, the police and the government, but maybe their parents as well. Mm. So he could see, you know, how families are being torn apart, torn apart because of this movement. Is there any end to it that you realistically see or see possible? Um, there's a huge concern, I think, from a lot of people in my family, realistically, that, you know, there was um, the release a few days ago from the CCP that um, any escalation of force from the Hong Kong protesters would result in um, in basically the deployment of the Chinese military <laughs> to to get things back under control, uh, similarly to Tiananmen Square. And so that any kind of escalation of this protest would result in swift and horrifying violence from the Chinese government. Um, and with that in mind, how does this proceed? How does this protest not just proceed, but culminate? How does it reach a conclusion that is um, <laughs> that is not that, <laughs> that, is, that is productive, basically? He calls the movement a failure as of now, a complete failure, uh, because he don't see, he doesn't see, you know, any of those five demands being properly answered. What he's, um, he he sort of thought of uh, a creative way to 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 sort of avoid that inevitable and horrible uh, results that you, you mentioned. He actually recommended the youth of Hong Kong to surrender themselves, to turn themselves in. If uh, there are 10 million or even more people who, who, who voluntarily go to jail, it's actually exceeding the capacity of uh, Hong Kong prisons. Mm. And that could be uh, a, a way to think out of the box to, 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 to topple um, the system in a different way. But now what he sees is that um, people are scared. People are running away. Um, uh, he still thinks that, as far as now is concerned, the movement is a failure. He thinks uh, the handover of Hong Kong has um, had um, taken place um, in the sense of um, uh, you know, international sovereignty, but not in the people's heart. So even when, uh, legally speaking, Hong Kong is part of China, deep in the Hong Kong people's mind and heart, they don't accept it. Mm. Um, he encourages um, the people of Hong Kong to know more about thy enemy. 
which is China, because um, China had already got her hand um, on Hong Kong's lifestyle and economy. So how are you going to liberate Hong Kong if you don't know your enemy? Uh, that's he. That's what he encourages the Hong Kong people to learn more about. Hong Kong's problem today isn't unique to Hong Kong. It could happen to London or U New York. They are all internationalized cities. They are all international financial hubs. Um, these cities are all under the influence of China. It's just a matter of pro proximity. Um, Hong Kong is being influenced or, or or China is laying its hand on on Hong Kong just like how China is um, trying to influence the global market in different ways uh, by the so-called rise of a new power mm. so um, 30 years ago uh, we thought um, the Chinese Communist Party would um, step down would, would, would be broken apart but it didn't happen so gradually um, it is uh, rising in the global stage so um, uh, the people of the world of the free world should be careful because what's happening in Hong Kong today are not unique to the people of Hong Kong someday it could happen to 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 New Yorkers or Londoners too, just in a different way. Mm -hmm. Anti-humanitarian crises had been crises had been ha taking place every day for the past thirty years in China, under um, people's eye without the people noticing, mm. because our attention had been taken away to ISIS in the in in the recent years but these things are actually happening every day in China we just it just escaped our our, our attention because uh, we were uh, bothered by other um, other forms of terrorism back then mm -hmm. but this totalitarian state China had been uh, you know, craving for power and building up its strength every, every day for the past 30 years. For example, um, Liu Xiaobo, um, the Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize winner, uh, he's been tortured and lynched uh, by the, the Chinese Communist Party uh, for most of his days uh, before his death. And he just died a quiet death um, in the hospital uh, at the end. And but the people of the free world uh, didn't really notice that happening. So uh, he's urging the people to care more about um, the anti-humanitarian crises happening in in China. And he thinks that that's one of the ways we could safeguard d democracy because if we don't do that, if we don't pay attention to these issues, um, democracy will be, will be slowly stripped away from us. The freedom we've been enjoying as a, uh, as a citizen of this contemporary world had actually given room for totalitarianism to, to gain power. Um, it, it freedom has been used as a defense for um, um, the, t the totalitarian state to defend their own actions, saying that is their liberty to do so. Um, also, uh, um, he thinks that without um, freedom in reality, there won't be uh, freedom in the virtual world as well, because. Um, and nowadays, the virtual world is um, creating a whole new realm mm. um, for people to enjoy their freedom. But that slowly diverted our attention to the uh, virtual world from the, the real world. He liked to um, uh, remind people that without 
um, actual freedom in reality, there won't be any in the virtual world. The Chinese Communist Party have manufactured a new generation of people through technology, and then they dispatch these people into corners of the world. For example, in London, there could be that hundred thousands of um, patriotic Hong Kong uh, Chinese, patriotic Chinese, who would. Uh, defend the regime at all costs. Uh, this Saturday, Ma Jian is going to take it on the street uh, um, um, during a rally in support of Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And he expects to see uh, hundreds of um, pro Beijing um, youth um, who, are studying, who are studying in London um, to have a row with him. Even though these um, students, when, when these students are, are studying abroad, they still surf on the internet with Baidu, their own version of Google, mm. their own forum instead of Reddit. So uh, no matter where they are, um, they are still gonna, the, 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 the Chinese mindset is deep rooted in their heart and they think that these people are um, the new form of army of um, China who would um, slowly erode freedom of elsewhere in the world. And he, think, he thinks that uh, the Chinese Communist Party is definitely a devil. <laughs> well, uh, we're going to talk more about uh, China's place in the virtual world, specifically games uh, and uh, the role of the UK specifically and the US um, next. But before we did that, do people want to take a break? Let's take a quick break, yeah? sure. Welcome back to Glasshouse Games. Uh, we're talking about Blitzchung, uh, Hong Kong, and China with Sam, Alex, and our guest, Ma Tian, who is talking to us through an interpreter. <laughs> Just gonna let the siren go past. <laughs> it's an emergency. Uh, so we talked about uh, the protests in Hong Kong uh, before the break. Uh, and now I wanted to talk about the role of the UK specifically, because obviously this is a, a complex conversation to have here in London. Um, because of this country's history with Hong Kong, um, which uh, the UK handed over to China in 1997, uh, for anyone who didn't know. Um, now, I know of people from Hong Kong who live here in the UK who've said that they wish that the country could still be ruled by the UK. Um, but given this country's imperialist history uh, across the world, that feels like a really uncomfortable idea um, for any person who lives here to have. Um, so, Majen, you were in Hong Kong at the time of the handover in 1997. Um, I wonder how the people of Hong Kong felt about the UK then and how they feel about the UK now and if that's changed. When the clock uh, struck at 12, he and his friends, his um, writer's friends, his friends who um, performed in a, who plays in a band, they were at his studio. Uh, he was hosting a reading club back then. Um, um, writers and performers such as Meng Zhao Ru were there. Um, they were reading uh, poets and songs about Hong Kong and China, and they had decided that once the clock struck uh, 12, they would become an underground organization because they had to come underground when the Communist Party took over. After 12, they all went uh, to the Lachiko building. Uh, there were 3,000 people surrounding the building uh, trying to protest. Uh, but uh, ironically, uh, the handover ceremony actually didn't happen in the Lachiko. It happened um, at the hotel next to the Lachiko building instead. Rain was pouring that day. Uh, after the protest at Lachiko, they all went to Lan Kwai Fong to have a drink. Um, when they were drinking, they were all crying, sobbing, bearing one thing in mind, we'll be back. 
Back then, he had a very, very strong feeling that uh, despite uh, the fact that uh, a group of people have immigrated to other countries, uh, those who stayed behind actually thought it wasn't such a big deal that the Chinese Communist Party is taking over um, Hong Kong since that moment. They actually thought that um, their livelihood and lifestyle would actually become better as they return to the motherland. Um, back then, uh, he and his fellow artists and poets friend uh, um, were very uncomfortable with the idea that uh, Hong Kongers actually accepted or welcomed um, the handover of the sovereignty. And therefore, they've been trying to do uh, lots of, for example, performance arts or hosting different um, events to remind people of um, how bad the situation actually is and to even try to point out or highlight the irony. Um, in one of his programs, um, he actually proposed that we should actually um, um, let the handover of sovereignty take place one day before the actual sovereignty, that is uh, the 1st of July. Um, through this, um, you know, which is some form of uh, performance art, it would um, highlight the irony that, oh, actually, uh, the, the return of uh, Hong Kong to his motherland has already happened once uh, on the day before. So if you host this uh, big glamorous uh, ceremony once again on the day after, it would only seem unnecessary mm. and ironic. And he also um, uh, sent a very famous postcard of Hong Kong to a very famous magazine. But uh, he posted um, the uh, postcard upside down, implying that um, Hong Kong has changed now and forever. He wrote an article for a magazine in Paris back then. And the analogy he used to describe the handover of sovereignty is that um, once there was a pregnant woman, um, uh, the father of the baby in her stomach is um, her British um, husband. However, for some strange reason, um, she, uh, those two loving lovebirds, they had to uh, part from each other and he has been forcefully uh, married to a Chinese husband whom she's never met. And it's just a horrible thing that's happening to her because she has to separate from her lover and it's very unfair to the children that's unborn. Um, this is somehow similar to what's happening in Hong Kong nowadays as well. Um, although um, the Chinese Communist Party has called the last governor of Hong Kong, um, uh, someone who had to be condemned by history for many, many years. He actually thinks the last governor of Hong Kong had done a very nice job in trying to protect Hong Kong's uh, freedom and fundamental rights. Um, he actually, uh, but um, despite all the promises, uh, he, uh, the last governor of Hong Kong from the Brits, uh, from Britain, uh, tried to preserve, uh, despite th his efforts to, to preserve Hong Kong's rights, uh, one thing he overlooked was that um, the Chinese Communist Party is essentially no different than a thug. So thuggish that um, now the Chinese Communist Party is actually uh, denying everything that's been promised uh, in the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the Joint Declaration, which is the agreement that the UK made with China over Hong Kong, is only in place until 2047, I think. 
Um, what does Machian think will happen then? What he hopes is that presidency will stand down by then. Um, he is a leader with no experience or even no concept uh, about freedom, democracy, and human rights. In this sense, Ma Jian thinks that he's actually worse than his predecessors. Uh, his, uh, his, sorry, his, his uh, the, 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 the presidents who were before him. Mm. Uh, for example, Zhao Ziyang, um, the premier uh, back in 1989. Mm. Um, but he also thinks that presidency simply won't live that long. So uh, even when, you know, uh, in terms of the statutory law of the uh, Chinese Communist Party, he could. Um, he could um, be elected over and over again to stay mm -hmm. in power, mm -hmm. but he just simply doesn't think that he will be in power in that, uh, uh, for that long. Um, he hopes that with uh, President Xi stepping down, there will be change in Hong Kong's situation because he thinks that Hong Kong's autonomy or independence uh, hinges upon uh, changes in uh, China's situation. He thinks that Hong Kong's current situation is a complete mess. Okay. So we'll talk now about the role of the US, I think, um, because uh, Activision Blizzard uh, is based in California and other US organizations have already faced controversy around their relationships with China this year even. So like the NBA, uh, which has faced apparently substantial losses after a team manager tweeted, fight for freedom, stand with Hong Kong. And then Chinese firms, including Tencent, which as we mentioned earlier, owns part of Blizzard, suspended deals that they had with the team. Um, so talking about um, the protests at BlizzCon that happened, uh, The Guardian published an article on November 8th, which ended with a quote from a man from California who said, I've been an enormous fan of Blizzard and WoW specifically, World of Warcraft, for years, but I also realized that there are people elsewhere in the world who can't voice their opinions like we can in America. And I'm a gamer who wants Blizzard to be successful. Come on, guys, I want you guys to do good. So there's this kind of comparison that people are drawing between American values and uh, Chinese values. Um, so Alex, you were born in the US, uh, in case people couldn't tell. Um, as someone who was born in the US, how do you feel about US citizens framing the issue like that? So for instance, the letter from US representatives to Blizzard insisted that companies like Blizzard, quote, promote American values like freedom of speech. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how is, uh, how is freedom of speech doing in America right now? Um, how is freedom of speech doing? I think that uh, people really only want the freedom of speech that they already support. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's a lot of, I guess, well, hypocrisy from all angles, from gamers, from companies, from the uh, from government, whatever kind of officials, whatever level. Um, and what I've I've really kind of started to realize um, through all of this and my my partner being Chinese actually is that there's Americans and especially the American both American culture the American economic system has much more in common with China than any of them would like to admit both and that goes both ways um, the only society, I should say, not even economic system, but the only society that's probably more capitalist minded than the US is feels like China, mm. um, where, you know, money is money and the extent that you will go to get money uh, and accept money is the guiding principle of the societies. Um, and that's clear, obviously, with American companies with, with what we're talking about now. Uh, with Blizzard and Activision uh, papering over principles for money, just mm -hmm. for the, the pursuit of money and or even the fear of losing out on an opportunity for money. And this is really the, there's so much of this back and forth of like, you know, American principles and 
But all of that is really just a shared principle with, with China of the pursuit of, of money that the Chinese government or Chinese companies will do whatever they see necessary to keep the money and mirroring whatever the U.S. is doing. Okay, because there's this idea that runs through all of this, I think, that... Um, so they were talking about this on Waypoint Radio, which is a games podcast I really like, um, and the idea that if you ask uh, companies like Activision Blizzard why they need to operate in China... Uh, they will say uh, it's a kind of soft power thing where if if you can operate in China, then you can gently promote Western values in the hope that China eventually becomes more democratic. And this was kind of reflected in the statement that the NBA made where they said something about we hope that sport can bridge mm -hmm. cultures. You know, basketball is incredibly popular in China as it is in America. The hope there is that you know, if Chinese citizens watch a lot of American sports, then eventually they will gently... Um, absorb American values, but it seems like you think maybe the uh, the opposite is happening. Uh, America is becoming more like China. Yeah, I don't know if you want to translate any of this first before. Okay, so <laughs> um, yeah, I think I do have a bit more cynical viewpoint, but I think it's because I ha that I have something of a double perspective, mm. um, and a lot of it I think stems that um, even seeing and hearing from on the netizens um, in rather in different forums and uh, my partner showing me conversations um, uh, equivalent of being extremely high upvoted um, remarks and stuff whenever whenever these things happen like um, the NBA um, the NBA thing or like when South Park was banned mm. in China after a recent episode um, young people young Chinese people are proud mm. that these things are getting banned. They're proud. There's a, there's a satisfaction that their government is doing something right and that, um, that those, whatever those means of entertainment, whatever those companies did, uh, that they deserve it. They, they deserve to have been banned in China mm. um, because they, sh they should have known better. Uh, there's a, there definitely seems to be a pride in, um, in those actions. Um, and it, th that mentality, I think, is counter to like they're they're so well bought in to their idea of of what it means to be Chinese, similar to Americans, mm -hmm. so well bought into what it means to be American, thinking that it's freedom of speech or whatever. But realistically, both of these are 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 centered around what it means to make money and what it means to be successful. Mm. Um, I I don't think that. Um, any company in the U.S., any corporation in the U.S. is considering um, the f dem democratic freedom of the Chinese people when they're making these decisions. Uh, the, they're all publicly traded companies. They all are at the behest of their shareholders. Mm -hmm. uh, and by definition, their number one priority is to make profits. Mm -hmm. There no, there's no priority of ensuring <laughs> ensuring democracy throughout the world, um, and you see that with with across any kind of um, any kind of business. I mean, energy companies will only make ecological changes if they see it as something they can market. <laughs> it's only something if it's profitable, then because they can market and people want it, then they'll invest in in cleaner energy. But if it's not, then there's not doesn't matter if it's better for the world. Mm. It's not making enough money. Similarly, Activision Blizzard or any other company is not going to make any changes to their own um, company values or enforce any company values unless it actually makes money. Even I think if it makes slightly less money, they're still not going to make that choice because that's that's not the driver of capitalism. The cap the driver of capitalism is as much money <laughs> by any means necessary, <laughs> I guess. I think uh, everyone who's living in the free world had um, may uh, have this uh, illusion or grand idea that they have the power to influence people who's living in an uh, uh, autocratic or totalitarian state. Uh, they would expect that once uh, the people in those uh, developing countries uh, had a greater economic success 
and better developed infrastructure when the uh, when the bourgeois is uh, getting big enough, they will soon embrace um, the global universal values. Um, he's pointing out the double standard uh, endorsed by the Chinese. Uh, if you celebrate Christmas in mainland China, they will call it a cultural invasion. Mm -hmm. But if they celebrate the Chinese New Year in London, they will call it an exchange of culture. Mm. People all thought that um, with China hosting the Olympic Games, uh, it would open the country up um, to embrace um, the universal values. Well, China did uh, open up uh, the broadcasting rights to BBC, but only for 23 days, and that's all. Mm. Um, when Google entered uh, the Chinese market, there were terms and uh, you know, regulations specifically written um, in the in the contract, black and white. Um, there were promises about um, freedoms, and um, uh, China had uh, made promises about opening up um, uh, its media, letting foreign media enter China when they uh, tried to strike a deal with Google. Um, but none of those promises had been fulfilled. So now that China had gained uh, the power she desired, not only is she trying to exert control and censorship over her own people, but also people from um, other countries. Uh, he remembered there was a female artist who uh, who uh, struck a post um, and uh, like the uh, covering her own eyes mm. uh, in support of the Hong Kong protest, and she immediately got censored. So that's how greedy China is nowadays. Not only trying to exert people on uh, exert control on her own netizens, but people from elsewhere as well. Uh, uh, this phenomenon is clearly seen. Um, in the exhibition um, that happened six years ago in London. Uh, back then, China uh, had a book, store, a book exhibition and in London, and uh, in the middle of the venue, uh, they were crammed with books that uh, celebrates how good China is, and not a single book mentioned uh, um, how President Mao ruled over China with brute force and causing lots of lots of casualties. He gave a call to his nephew um, yesterday because his nephew is a video gamer himself. <laughs> um, what he his uh, nephew told him is that actually um, what uh, video gamers in China are playing is no different than um, the video games people around the world mm. are playing. The only difference is that um, the translated Chinese official version of those video games actually uh, isolates them from uh, the community elsewhere in the world because of the server. And mm. that single difference actually makes a huge difference. Mm. He finds it an absolute nonsense that um, businessmen are trying to enter the Chinese market for the sake of um, uh, promoting universal values inside China. Their sole goal is to make money. Mm. Um, and that has a... Uh, 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 when they enter the Chinese market, they thought they could influence China, but in fact, they have to succumb to uh, the Chinese regulations and customs, so there's nothing that they could do about it. And it also, at the same time, gives a wrong impression to local Chinese 
uh, netizens or video gamers that, oh, actually, it, that's all universal values is about. It's actually not such a big deal. Hmm. It's setting a bad example for um, Chinese people. Okay. So let's talk about how the games industry works in China then and why video game companies are so interested uh, in Chinese players. So there are 630 million people in China who play video games, so obviously a huge market. Um, And then the state administration of press and publication decides what games get released in China. Um, there, There was a backlog, I think, last year where games weren't getting approved. So there was a big kind of period where games weren't uh, coming out officially. But um, so there's a really interesting article on Eurogamer called Gaming Beyond the Great Firewall of China that is worth a read um, that talks about how people play games in China. Um, so global Steam is apparently available in China, um, even though you would think that uh, Chinese players wouldn't be able to access the games that are available in the rest of the world. Um, And there's a gray market of kind of cyber markets and a website called Taobao, um, where people can buy games uh, that they want to play. But um, in order to release games officially in China, games companies have to censor the content of the games. Um, So they have to maybe remove certain things um, or they wouldn't be able to release the games in China. Um, So, Majian, more than a decade ago, you wrote in The Guardian that China's place as a world economic power is assured. Uh, China not only can, but does say no to the West and is demanding apologies for every perceived slur. How is the West responding? Wrong footed. It has repeatedly made obeisances to the tyrannical regime and said sorry. So do you still feel that way? And do you think that uh, video game companies can and should do anything to avoid apologizing to China or censoring themselves? Um, The mentality um, the Chinese are having, that is, to demand apology Mm. from um, other countries everywhere, is overarching uh, in different walks of life, in different realms, in literature, in arts, in business, um, or even, um, um, you know, embodied in the issues um, regarding video gaming and the internet. Um, They are demanding apologies in different ways, uh, maybe in a more subtle way, uh, a less explicit or aggressive way. For example, uh, when they are striking economic deals with the EU, UK, um, US, uh, they would uh, demand apology or uh, demand um, uh, these countries to succumb or to, 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 to their way of doing things. Um, otherwise, they would um, use their economic power to um, make them kowtow. Uh, Huawei is an example. Mm. Uh, uh, another example would be uh, what um, China has been doing to the free world and Norway for um, giving Liu Xiaobo a Nobel Prize. Mm. Um, so talking specifically about Blizzard then, um, so obviously, so Activision Blizzard makes about 12% of its income in the Asia Pacific region. So obviously Chinese players are hugely important to the company. Um, so the entertainment industry in general wants to appeal to China, even maybe needs to for the sake of their bottom line. Um, and so Blizzard has done things like created uh, China targeted content so it has a World of Warcraft expansion called Mists of Pandaria, which is all, it's, you know, lots of pandas and very designed to appeal to a Chinese audience. Uh, and then in Overwatch, there's a character called Mei, who is uh, Chinese. Um, Sam, this is where we're going to talk to you. I know, so Sam has been quiet for this entire time <laughs> in learning, case people have forgotten that she's here. <laughs> um, but so Blizzard likes to portray itself as a company that represents a diverse range of cultures. How well do you think they manage that? And I think I think the simplest way to do this is actually to work backwards mm-hmm. um, from that perception, and actually to go back to something sort of frame this within something you said earlier about Jeff Kaplan mm. coming out and and insisting that they um, that they do have to um, lift these suspensions and stuff um, because I think there is a tendency with Blizzard, um, in particular their creative side, to pretend that. 
I mean, in that case, for Kaplan to pretend that, you know, he's on the side of the protesters and they would, and, you know, it's just it's up to the higher-ups, it's the brass that's in the way. Um, whereas, actually, I feel that the actual, I think even the creative side of Blizzard actually is really contributing to this issue. And mm. the diversity is an interesting one. And so to work, work backwards, on the face of it, yes, Overwatch um, in particular has a very diverse cast. Um, racially, there's a mix, of, you know, and there's a mix in terms of gender as well between men and women. And then, obviously, there are two queer characters. Um, but when you start to pick that apart, it's, it falls apart. And to start with the queer characters in particular, um, there are only two. Mm. And in both those cases, it's not explicit that they are. It's v- in, in both cases, it's not in the game itself. The references to their queer identity is entirely within um in both cases in little comics mm-hmm. that are released and, and it's we're talking like a panel and, and in the case of so in the case of tracer it's one panel where she's with her girlfriend and in the case of soldier 76 it's a case where it's not even really stated as such it's mostly implied it's very vague um and so they're the pers- and i think this sort of embodies a lot of the the steps they have made which is it's they're it's enough to be. Per- it's enough that they can say on paper, yeah, we have queer characters, but in actuality, it's not great and presumably easily removed for when they do go to international markets like China. Um, but I think what players in the West respond to particularly is mistakes. Um, so we had before the Blitzchung thing, we had mistakes like um, with the Sigma character, they had the there was this um, controversy around the asylum look. When they did mm. the character, um, they had him in a straight jacket and stuff. With bare feet, right? Yes, which was supposed to embody the uh, like. There was an interview with the the artist, um, the designer, who would said that this was meant to evoke. The, and uh, quoting them here was the asylum look, mm. um, because you know when you're in a mental health place, apparently you can't have footwear, um, which I can say from experience is not true. <laughs> um, and but this 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 was this is sort of like endemic of like a lot of their problems because they did come out and apologize but it was very much after the fact um and i think when you go back further you in overwatch you have issues again with like farah um who they gave her a character skin that was styled on indigenous cultures american Mm. north american indigenous cultures Mm -hmm. Um, but she, in, in terms of the fiction, was at that time said to be of Egyptian descent. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was an immediate response of, like, is, there, is our, our, our culture or culture is just a costume that you can put on? And so they later um, addressed this um, by then retroactively claiming that her father was indigenous. And they haven't said <laughs> from which nation from which you know which indigenous culture or peoples they're referring to and to this day the, the quote that stands is um apparently that Farah's father's first nation tribe is known by the developers and they may reveal it at a later date so they're holding as this, soon as they research it <laughs> as soon as they research yes yeah, so they're holding this back in a way that seems to like they're going oh we don't like you know, I mean, they're playing both sides here where they're going, oh, we've, we know what it is, but we're just not telling you. Um, is there is there a, a sense in which they're waiting to use it when they need some good PR? Well, this this, well, this is what happens because it's this recurring thing. This is this pattern. You know, they fuck up, they apologize, they make a little, they make a little progress. Um, and this goes all the way back through those. This isn't just like Overwatch. You go through... And, and in the case of World of Warcraft, this isn't really being addressed because in World of Warcraft, the basis of the game, you have all the monster races. Um, so your orcs, um, the tauren, all that, are based on peoples and cultures from around the world. Mm. Meanwhile, the humans remain solely white European in terms of their culture. And, and in fact, the option to play as people of color as a, as a human wasn't available until this year. Um, um, World of Warcraft is a very old game. Is very, World of Warcraft has been running since 2004. Mm. Um, and so, but I think what sort of came forward, you know, there's a, so there is, there is like a, cons, you know, there's a consistent trend towards othering, um, particularly where it pertains to race and culture. Mm. Um, and I think this was like, 
I think the, the cause of this was perfectly summed up a few years ago, actually. And I think there was an incident where um, Jeff Kaplan at the Dice Summit um, went, re- talked, did a half-hour talk about how they made the El Dorado map. Um, and which revealed that their process started with Googling colorful, Amer- colorful Mexican town, um, which one Google is not where your research into anything should start um, if you're a professional you know, company especially. Um, and secondly, they were, that immediately is bias. They've, mm. they've looked for a colorful, they've already colored exactly what they're looking for right there from the start. Mm-hmm. But what they ended up doing was in this talk, he explains how they find a image of a, a, a colorful Mexican town that met their perception of what that should be. And they pretty much use that as the basis for the entire El Dorado map. It's got, you know, colorful painted villas and stuff on this on the coast. And they, um, and he, you, you know, and then he reveals in this talk that, um, oh, actually, um, we, we later find out, and this is supposed to be earnest and self-depreciating, and he says, oh, well, we actually found out it was a it was a village in Italy, and it wasn't in Mexico at home. And he's like, and he jokes that, well, when we do the Italy map, we'll we'll base it on you know a town in Mexico. And incidentally, when they did do the Italian map, they very explicitly based it on Venice, Italy. So there was you know that was you know that joke is completely thrown away. But th- what what's interesting about that though is I think it illustrates the way Blizzard thinks and operates, which is that the and I can't speak to their motivations, but you can imagine that it's very cynical, um, that they want to be seen as progressive. Mm. But when it comes to actually doing the research and in, you know, making an effort to be inclusive that would actually be meaningful, they don't do that. They, and this, you know, this example sums up where it's, yeah, we wanted this and the research, all the research we did was just to support our preconception. And I feel like this is, if you, Assume that that is true of all these controversies. You can see a process in which they have, a, you know, they have an end goal. They find research to justify it, and you see that in the fire thing. They retroactively justify it, and I think there's a pattern here of doing the bare minimum or, or less. Um, and I think it's starting to turn now. Where I think when Overwatch came out, there was people who were like, "Wow, there's this really diverse um, shooter." That's great, and I think over time you've now started to see a shift towards people feeling, I guess, disillusioned with that. That mm-hmm. actually Blizzard's efforts are largely token. Um, have and we, have we seen that reflected in the recent announcement of uh, the new character Sojourn, the yeah, black woman character? Yeah, I think there's a lot of skepticism about that. I mean, I've from the people I follow on Twitter and stuff online, the the immediate reaction was just like too little, too late. Mm. Um, that and and I guess also a fear that actually when it comes to release that there's going to be pro- like the delivery of this is the execution of her inclusion is going to be bad, um, and I think given the history that that's completely warranted. And the the thing with that though is this culture of ignorance that I think is defines Blizzard as a studio and their creative process it also plays into the thing with Blitzjung because you had you fucked up. Um, they waited until the response came back to them that, oh, hey, and, you know, people were calling out, there was protests. They then apologized publicly, but they didn't lift the suspension. Mm. Um, and, you know, they drafted a very elaborate apology for that at BlizzCon. Um, Jeff Cam- Kaplan's statement was after that. Mm. So as far as I'm concerned, it's incredibly disingenuous. Like, if, if there's any notion that he actually cared to me, I was like, you waited a month, you waited all that time, you waited until after your company apology, and then you declare that actually you would like to see it. For me, that's, he is, at, you know, at best towing the company line, or at best has been told, hey, if you could do this, just so that people are still on board with her product. Hmm. And, you know, you give the illusion that you care and actually, you know, Blizzard actually cares about the Hong Kong protesters. But the reality is they just want to make money and they just want to keep sales of their game. And you've already seen people, I've seen people online who have been appeased by Blizzard's efforts. And they go, I wasn't going to, I was going to stop buying Blizzard games. But actually what they've said now, I will, I will now start buying their games again, even though, you know, meaningfully they haven't made any changes at all. Okay, so it's kind of what Alex was saying earlier about um, they they claim to support free speech, they claim to support diversity, but only so far as it suits their bottom line. Absolutely. Okay. Like um, I think 
Overwatch. I mean, the fact the fact of the matter is, a lot of this representation of other cultures and stuff exists only in skins within Overwatch. It's, it's all costume. Mm. Um, so, you know, you have to buy. You have to. You either have to play a lot of in time in the game, or you have to buy the loot boxes to get those things. So those. It's not like those are those are things handed to you. Even if you purchase the game, you've still got to put further time in to get those. So even those token efforts of representation are behind a paywall. I don't I don't think there's anything sincere about it at all. So speaking about um, May in Overwatch, so this Chinese character that we have in Overwatch, uh, protesters have started to draw fan art of her in protest gear. Uh, apparently in the hope that it will get the game banned in China. Um, I wonder if Majian thinks that that kind of thing could work, that the that people who support Hong Kong are trying to co-opt the Chinese character in Overwatch. He's very impressed by um, all sorts of ways um, Hong, uh, Hong Kongers could think of to um, promote the protest to the world. Uh, apart from... Um, drawing the image of May on the streets. He's most impressed by how uh, Hong Kongers have been, um, you know, digging up rock, uh, rocks and bricks on the street uh, to try to set up roadblocks mm. uh, to uh, stop the police from coming or firing tear gas at, at them. Uh, how they built their their, their roadblocks were using um, bricks, uh, erecting them like stone hinges in the UK. And, and from afar, that would look like an actual person standing up. And the imagery is very, very meaningful. Um, he thinks that when the oppressed are lynched and persecuted, um, this um, extreme situation would, would only um, elicit uh, their creativity. Mm -hmm. He thinks that um, under oppression, uh, infinite creativity will be sparkled uh, from the people. Um, uh, creativity is normally reflected in literature or in different forms of art. But uh, the oppression has brought uh, this form of creati creativity into the reality. Because in reality, Xi, President Xi, is trying to become the emperor of China. And uh, creativity could no longer remain only in the realms of uh, arts and literature. They have to bring it import it into reality as well. Um, uh, during what's happened in the Polytechnic University recently in Hong Kong, uh, one scene particularly moved his heart. Um, he actually um, shed tears because of it. Um, he saw people um, using sprays and painted four words on the walls say no to absurdity this is very philosophical he thinks that this is how absurd the reality is currently okay and when it comes to people wanting to express their support of the protests in hong kong you know blizzard they won't reduce this suspension um they have said that they want to keep the official channels focused on the game rather than letting people express their political views. Do you think that that is fair, that, that Blizzard can say you can't talk about politics here? Or do you think that they should let people talk about those things in interviews after the game? He finds it absolutely unfair. Um, uh, but even with uh, Activision Blizzard uh, not agreeing to back down and reduce uh, the suspension punishment. Um, he thinks that um, the other players and gamers in the world should still voice out their opinion and step up their game and, and show their support and solidarity um, to Bliss Joan and the people of Hong Kong. Uh, if um, uh, Blizzard aren't recognizing um, the achievement of Blizzard Zone. 
maybe the people could recognize him, mm. uh, give him an award. Um, it's true that Bliss Jung has lost uh, six months of his um, digital gaming career, but if Hong Kong has lost this time, if Hong Kong is to become a lost cause, it will be forever. So um, uh, everyone in the world should stop that from happening. Okay. When we talk about the the actions that video game players can make, I have a couple more questions. And one is, it kind of relates to what Alex was saying earlier about how um, the some of the, the protesters have started using kind of anti-Chinese slurs and things. There's a lot of anti-China sentiment in the video games industry among players. So we see things like whenever the company Tencent uh, acquires a part of a video game company, a lot of players are very angry about that. And it seems like some people find it difficult to separate criticism of the CCP from criticism of just China in general. And there is a risk, I think, that uh, it almost um, it almost becomes racism. You know, we just anti-China in general rather than anti the government. How can people uh, speak out against the Chinese government and the actions that they're taking without going so far as to start being anti-Chinese? I think the first thing um, the people of the world have to realize or differentiate is that there are two concepts. Um, the CCP is the master mm. and uh, the Chinese people are their slaves. Um, the Chinese people are what um, the CCP had tried to manufacture or nurture. So they actually had have no, um, no personal freedom to have their own view. To, uh, they're not entitled to think individually. So uh, once we realized that, um, we could... Um, focus on the um, um, the actual culprit of this phenomenon being the CCP instead of the Chinese people. Just now while um, we were talking, um, since we are uh, recording this program in a glass house, right? Um, Ma Jian was looking outside of this transparent window and he's been counting how many Chinese people had actually walked past our store, our restaurant, our cafe, our bar uh, for the past hour. He counted, there were 37. Hmm. He's sure that by the time you guys open tomorrow, there will be Chinese people who's gonna come have a drink. And that would be our window of opportunity to talk to them, to try to teach them, um, you are able to think critically and independently. That's a start. Okay. Uh, Ma Jian is drawing comparison um, uh, with uh, Nazism in, in, in Germany or what's been happening in Iran. He finds Chinese people particularly sensitive um, when they've been uh, viewed differently or always stereotypically associated with communism. Um, by contrast, um, um, the people of Germany uh, actually uh, accepted um, the massacre of the Jews as part of their history. Uh, they are less sensitive. Um, the reason why Chinese people are these uh, are this sensitive is because it's simply because of how they've been educated back in China. Mm. So maybe finally then, what do we think that video game players who support the protesters in Hong Kong should do? What else should they do? I mean, should they do anything and what can they do? Is maybe is boycotting the games a good start? I guess the first thing um, uh, gamers all around the world could do is to really um, start talking about real life politics in in the virtual world. Um, when a winner of a video game has lost 
his rights to voice his opinion. Um, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, others, as fellow gamers, should um, should exercise their right to speak up more often. Um, he believes that um, video gaming is just like any sport, boxing, basketball. Um, these gamers, uh, they're gamers in the virtual world, but um, in real life, they're all part of the electoral college. They have the rights to vote. So um, they sh not only should uh, exercise their rights when it comes to elections, they should also um, talk about politics or at least not avoid politics um, in all walks of life, in all realms uh, of sports they're playing. Okay, and uh, you had a, a call to action for us as well, didn't you? So what are you doing and what do you think that other people should do? One of the things he thought um, we as people living in the UK, in London, could do is to urge the, the UK government to um, own their responsibility um, because the UK has always had a say in Hong Kong-related issues. The UK simply can't let the CCP declare that uh, the Sino-British Joint Declaration is void unilater unilaterally. Mm. Um, it is not at all a mere historical uh, document. Um, he would like uh, to invite um, one of the protesters, um, Joshua Wong, to the UK um, to uh, testify um, in front of the parliament uh, to um, give a presentation on Hong Kong's um, current situation and urge uh, the parliament and the UK government to really take some actions um, in, to, to intervene themselves um, related um, to the issues currently happening in Hong Kong. Um, uh, locally, he also thinks that Hong Kong protesters should uh, incorporate the element of um, China in their protests. Uh, what does he mean by that? Um, is that um, since um, China is an actor, like an entity participating in this, in this um, polity or in this system. So you're actually not only fighting against the local Hong Kong government. The Chinese Communist Party is behind it. So uh, he thinks that um, Hong Kong protesters should also learn more about the real enemy behind and try to see if um, there's something they should do about the real culprit behind. Uh, in terms of uh, what he meant um, when he talked about uh, involving China uh, into uh, taking China into account when 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 protesters in Hong Kong uh, think of the movement, he drew he, he used an analogy. Um, uh, people who've never seen the sun would never feel how warm the sunshine could be. Um, so he w he was trying to say that um, we should um, enlighten mainland Chinese about how how good uh, democracy and freedom is. Uh, that would be essential uh, for Hong Kong's protests. Um, he's another thing he's trying to do is uh, he's trying to build a website to keep a record of all the victims and casualties who may be injured or even died or been raped um, because of the anti-extradition movement in Hong Kong. Um, he, find it, he finds it essential to, to let history preserve these names lest people forget about them. Mm -hmm. um, if you have read the news last night, um, the Human Rights and Democracy Act has actually been passed in the US. Um, 
he finds uh, international support necessary to um, for the cause of Hong Kong's movement. Um, the other thing uh, we could do internationally is that he knows that um, the Time magazine um, has a vote every year um, around December. Uh, people will vote for uh, the person of the year. And he hopes that um, video gamers around the world could give their vote to protesters in Hong Kong who've been risking their lives for the sake of democracy and freedom. Awesome. Well, if anyone watching or listening has thoughts, you can post on glasshouse.games. You can email us at community at glasshouse.games. Uh, you can tweet us at GHD show uh, and uh, we will read any good letters that we get uh, on the show. Uh, now, finally, as always, we follow up all that food for thought with actual food. And this week, Alex P has provided. Ba, 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 ba. What is it, Alex? We have a uh, Hong Kong egg tart. Hong Kong egg tart. <laughs> <laughs> Our interpreter is very excited. <laughs> These uh, are from Bun House in London. Bun House, excellent food in Bun House in London. Uh, everyone should try it. I just uh, have to work out how to get the plastic off. <laughs> the sound of ripping cellophane will be great on the audio only version of this. If I hold the plate. Uh, no, no, no. There we go. You thought that. Where you got there? Ma once thought you were the one who baked these. <laughs> uh, at one point, uh, but not these ones. <laughs> <laughs> he can make them, but not these. Mm. Um, for the benefit of those who are listening, well, mm. I'm sure you know what egg Thank tarts you. look like. Thank you. Uh, they are pastry with uh, yellow filling. Mm. Thank you. I've never had these. So it's, it's an egg custard okay. filling. Alex, you um, have to tell us how you make them while we all try so them. So normally, well... They can become in the the crust can either be sort of like a pastry type um, crust, but we do it sort of more of a cookie sort of shortbread style. Um, that's entirely because that's the way my partner prefers it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, we're really just looking for like the very sort of crisp smooth custardiness for the filling mm. and this is these would be very popular in like cha cha thing style cafes casual cafes in in hong kong very smooth filling mm. 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 You, you, <laughs> you know how to make these yourself? my my partner would be um much better at it than i mm. i would just uh <laughs> Delicious. I might finish mine after <laughs> after the show. I wasted no time. <laughs> Very it's impressive. Done. Is yours completely gone? Yeah. It's gone. Wow. I haven't eaten today, so. Well, we'll have to make sure you eat after this. Um, do you have anything you want to share for the week ahead, any of you? Um, I think I think just to follow on from everything we've talked about, I think um, if if we think not buying Blizzard games has any chance of having any positive effect. I just want to say to people that it is, we live in an age of so many good games and mm. we're always talking about how we don't have enough time for all the games that are out, how easy it should be to just not buy Blizzard games. If you feel if you feel strongly about any of this, I think it's very easy to make a statement and just not buy their games. I, I honestly so, sometimes get quite relieved when I have an excuse not to play games by a particular company for a while so just there because there are so many games. You'll have so much time with all that time, you won't be playing Overwatch 2 and Diablo 4 and whatever else. <laughs> Um, come down to Glasshouse Brick Lane. Yes, come down to Glasshouse Brick Lane. <laughs> Corner uh, of Brick Lane so there you go. and Bethnal Green Road, yeah. London. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, these are popular. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think I missed one point that uh, Ma Jiang was trying to make. Okay. That, um, this coming Saturday, there's going to be a rally happening in London. Mm. So, uh, Saturday, apart from give the, the date. Yeah, sure. Um, 23rd is that yeah I think it's the 23rd of of November this, this might this might come out after that has happened oh. but I think, yeah, the chance, sorry, this will be we can definitely mention it so that and recommend that people follow up on mm. 
what happened and uh, keep reading the news. I, th- I think the point from that, though, is that there are protests here in London and the UK that are mm. worth participating in. It's not, don't assume that this only happens in Hong Kong. Like, there's activism to be done here that can have a really big effect. So. Right, and yeah, people in the UK can reach out to their you know, friends from Hong Kong. There's a lot of people from Hong Kong living in this country because of the history of our relationship with Hong Kong. So um, that's something that people can do as well. Uh, Majian is busy eating an egg tart, but I wanted to ask uh, if he has uh, anything to plug. We've got your book right here. We can talk about the book. I'm sure that's available for sale. Yeah, well, the 整个这本书我就在描述um, the book's title is called Chinese Dream, but uh, essentially it's not a dream. Um, it's a result of brainwashing. Um, the main character um, in his fiction um, eventually has gone nuts, mm. has lost his conscious mind because of um, the brainwashing. And is not only happening in the fictional world, it's happening in the real world as well. As well. Mm-hmm. And I presume people can buy that at all good bookshops, uh, in the UK at least, probably not in China. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Majan, for joining us this week. Yes, it's been really great you. to have you. Uh, and thank you, Sam and Alex, for sitting in. Uh, I know you didn't get to talk much, but hopefully you found that interesting. I've learned a lot, so this was very worthwhile for myself. Awesome. And thank you to Kit as well, as always, for making the show happen every week. And to Dan C. Parks for the music. I'm Jordan Erica Weber. Talk again soon. <laughs>